Greetings, Hill Avenue Grace Lutheran Church. Pastor Zachary Johnson here. It is Wednesday, May 6th, and it is time for our midweek devotional. And uh, the readings for today are Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 60. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. And the gospel is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Uh, so uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, get to it. So let's, uh, first of all, uh, take a couple moments to uh, prepare our hearts again. Uh, I invite you to uh, listen uh, as I read these texts and uh, pay attention to how the Spirit is speaking to you through them. And of course, if you'd like to share anything in the comments on this video, please do so. If you'd like to share anything with me personally, you can always email me. Uh, and, uh, so let's go ahead and get started with God's Word. Uh, let's take a few moments first. All right. A reading from Acts chapter 7. But filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And when the witnesses laid and the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then he had said this, he died. And the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Not the, uh, not the most sunny, joyous texts uh, this time around. Um, it, this uh, text is the stoning of Stephen. Uh, Stephen uh, was considered by the book of Acts to be the first martyr for Christianity. Um, basically, uh, what happens here is Stephen is proclaiming Jesus and all that stuff, and he starts getting into an argument with some Jewish opponents. Um, the opponents can't withstand uh, Stephen's logic and argumentation and so uh, they conspire against him uh, by uh, convincing people to create false testimony against him, saying that he is being blasphemous towards God and everything. Um, and this causes Stephen to be arrested and to go in front of the council, uh, where he, again, more false testimony is given, and the council asks him if all these accusations are true. Uh, and Stephen then goes into this long speech about the history of Israel murdering its prophets, um, starting with Moses and going through, uh, and much of chapter 7 is devoted to that speech of Stephen. Um, but what we get for this Sunday is the conclusion, where after Stephen is finished speaking, um, the crowd becomes enraged at him for his words. Uh, and ultimately, they end up proving his point uh, by uh, going out and stoning him and killing him, again, murdering another prophet of God. Um, so there's a bit of irony in that. Um, but the, the section that we get, verses 55 through 60, um, is all about um, Stephen at his death. Um, it's clear that um, he is not bothered by his death. Um, because, uh, because his vision shows him that God is right there with him, uh, comforting him in the midst of this. Um, and, uh, he's, he's not really paying attention to the fact that he's being stoned to death, which I'm guessing would be very, very painful. Um, but he is more paying attention to the fact that God is with him, uh, and that, um, God will deliver him ultimately, uh, not, not from his life, of course, but into the, the, the promise of resurrection. Um, so, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, here we also get the introduction to Saul, um, who is 
Paul, St. Paul, um, the guy who wrote all those letters, um, before he's Paul, he's known as Saul. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul is his Hellenistic name, uh, his, his more Romanesque name, you could say. Um, so here is the first introduction to Saul. And if you know about the history of Saul Paul, um, Paul started out as a um, Pharisaic Jew who uh, was very, very, um, what do I want to say? Well, he um, was very high up on Jewish law. And uh, because of that, was well a well-known persecutor of followers of Jesus, um, would hunt them down, seek them out, uh, help with judgment, and, 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 of course, righteous killing in his mind. Um, so, uh, you know, he was a Pharisaic Jew who hunted down those who followed Christ and um, would see to their deaths for their blasphemies. This, of course, is before he had the, the story in Acts chapter 9 where Paul loses his ability to see, he has a vision of Christ, and is ultimately converts to becoming Christian himself. So, um, but here is where Acts introduces him for the first time. And of course, he's right there at the stoning of Stephen. Um, why witnesses are putting coats down at their feet? Scholars aren't quite sure. Other than maybe it was to help them with the better range of motion for their arms for the stoning. <laughs> so uh, take that what you will. Um, but it, uh, it, this is where we get in inter our first introduction to Saul, who eventually, you know, changes his name to Paul. Um, a couple other interesting things is um, there's a question about whether or not Luke is uh, the writer, um, of course, of the book of Acts is the same writer who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And there's a question about whether or not Luke is um, making a case here for individual judgment, um, that the final judgment day is on the day that the individual passes away versus a ultimate judgment day where Christ comes back and the entire universe is is judged and and so on and so forth. Um, and there's a question of, is, is Luke trying to make the case here that uh, the last judgment is an individual thing that happens to us uh, when we when each of us dies at our own time, as opposed to a universal judgment? Um, and of course, they're all divided on that. There's no consensus as to whether or not Luke is making that um, claim or not with this vision from Stephen uh, as he sees... Uh, the heavens open and, and Jesus standing there and knows that God is comforting him in his final moments of life. Uh, and, you know, we'll never know ourselves. Um, we'll never know if uh, the, uh, the final judgment happens to each of us individually when we die or if there will be a universal final judgment. Um, because the truth of the matter is, when we die, uh, we'll be dead and um, we'll have no sense of the passage of time. And so our experience, uh, you know, so we don't, we won't know what our experience of the final judgment is. Uh, and frankly, we might not even care. Because um, the promise of resurrection, of course, is that we will be in God's eternal embrace forever, with God forever. Uh, and that is such a joyous thing that we might not even care how the final judgment takes place, whether it's individually or universally. Um, that's just my take on it, that uh, I don't think it's going to matter because... Uh, you know, we believe in the promise of resurrection, and uh, it's going to be such a joyous thing for us, uh, and that I don't think we're really going to care how God judged us in the end. Um, what's interesting here, though, is um, the contrast between the crowd crying out and Stephen crying out. Uh, the crowd cries out in anger, and they cover their ears so that they don't hear uh, the proclamation of Stephen's vision. Uh, and of course, they're doing it because they think anything coming out of Stephen's mouth at this point is blasphemous, and uh, 
not to be heard. But of course, the ultimate irony in it is by covering their ears, they are missing this wonderful proclamation from Stephen of seeing Jesus sit, standing at the right hand of God, uh, proclaiming that you know Jesus is God's Son, Lord and Savior. They miss that. Um, and, but, and of course, when they're crying out in anger, they can't hear that either. Uh, on the flip side, when Stephen cries out, it is with a voice of forgiveness. Stephen cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. I mean, that's, that's pretty powerful. That even at his, in the moment of his death, where he's being wrongly stoned, um, that he still cries out for the forgiveness of his enemies, of his persecutors. Um, and, and asking for their forgiveness, he's also asking God to open their hearts to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, he's not saying, hey, God, their, or, their hearts are already hardened, so further harden their hearts so they won't believe in you. But no, he's saying, forgive them, God. Forgive them so that their hearts might become open to this understanding of who Jesus really is. Uh, so I think that's, a, that's just a wonderful thing that Stephen does in the midst of his death when he's being stoned by his enemies. He prays for God's forgiveness for them in the hope that their hearts will be opened to the message of Jesus and believe in him. Um, but that's kind of, um, that's kind of the Acts reading there. So, you know, we get the, the, the stoning of the first martyr of Christianity, Stephen, and we get the introduction to Saul, and then, uh, we get this, this, um, this assurance from Stephen of, God being with us in our final moments, as God is with Stephen, and he cries out and proclaims that. And then we get this beautiful uh, understanding of uh, forgiveness uh, in the hopes that people will, that these people will open their hearts to Jesus eventually. Um, so there's, there's lots of, even though it's a very short five verses, and it's kind of a gloomy text because it's about stoning someone to death. There are some rich, beautiful things here found within this text. All right, so we're going to move on to the first Peter reading. There we go. Uh, so this reading is uh, continuing the epistle of first Peter, which we've been on for uh, several weeks now. Uh, and uh, this uh, particular passage is in, found in chapter 2, starts at verse 2, and it goes through verse 10. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll read it. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they d were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were a people, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, these First Peter texts are full of lots of rich, wonderful things. Um, this text is not as difficult to digest as last week's text was. Um, 
but there are there are a couple things that I do want to talk about with it. Um, but, but first, um, so spiritual milk, um, the this imagery that uh, these uh, folks that First Peter are addressing, uh, which is a Gentile community, should long for the nurturing of faith as an infant longs for the milk of its mother. Now, uh, the understanding here is not that their faith is immature, and through receiving the spiritual milk, they'll grow in maturity. But more, it's this understanding that they, as a Christian community who follow Jesus now, should continually long for God's word, like a, like a newborn infant continually longs for its mother's milk. So it's not about this understanding that we are immature and will continue to grow in our maturity, but it's more about this understanding that we want to constantly seek out God's word because it does nourish us, because it does give us nurturing. And yes, it does cause us to grow in our faith. Um, but it's not to be understood that uh, somebody's immature and then grows in their maturity, but more this understanding that we constantly seek this out because it nourishes us, it nurtures us, and it, it helps us as we walk along our faith journey. So uh, so this, this spiritual milk is all about uh, dwelling continually in God's word and learning from it and, and, and letting it nurture, nurture us and nourish us. Um, so then we get to this imagery of Jesus as the precious living stone and us to also be like living stones. And I found myself, myself why, why, do you, why would the author use living stone imagery here? Uh, kind of, what is the, what's the author getting at? Um, and it's just some thoughts that came to my mind is, well, stones are firm and strong. Uh, much stronger than than wood and and of course you know mud and, and and hay and and all that it's very sturdy strong and firm material um and i, I should mention here that uh the stones that are referenced here in the greek refer not to like large boulders that you might find on the countryside but stones that have been shaped and molded for building something. So they are, they're, they're literally building stones uh, to, to, to build upon. Um, and of course, uh, back in the, uh, the, the Roman Empire, in the, these, the time that this letter was written, you know, uh, a lot of fortresses were made out of stone. Uh, stone was considered, you know, very strong material that could withstand lots of attacks and help protect you. Um, Stones were also those that could withstand storms. Um, so it, it was so stones were not only being strong and firm, but they could build these fortresses that could protect people from attacking armies, from uh, from storms and such. Uh, you know, so so it's a very it's this imagery of protection. Stones are the the, the living stones are there to protect us, to keep us safe, but also to withstand things. And, uh, and also, stones can bear a lot of weight, can't they? Um, and and, and um, so then there's this imagery of us being living stones, um, that uh, being communal together, uh, we can build this strong structure that uh, is, of course, grounded in Christ, because uh, then we talk about Christ being the cornerstone, and the cornerstone, of course, is the most important part of the foundation. Um, so with Jesus being our cornerstone, being the living precious stone in God's sight, and us being like living stones following Jesus, uh, we can build up uh, this communal structure that helps to protect ourselves from evil, and uh, also uh, withstanding the attacks of non-believers and and the brokenness of the world uh and also uh bearing each other up um 
stones are strong and firm and can bear a lot of weight, and so we can therefore uh, bear up each other and, and help walk with each other in the midst of all of the burdens that we're carrying, uh, knowing that we can lean on each other uh, for strength, for comfort, for love, and of course, uh, because we are also leaning on the power of Jesus, uh, the cornerstone. Um, so that's kind of my take on, on this stone imagery here. Um, this understanding that we are, are this community of strong, firm, a strong, firm structure that helps protect each other, uh, and 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 bears each other's burdens, joys, and concerns, and we do so knowing that we're, our foundation is Jesus, the cornerstone. The strongest stone among us who helps us to do these things. Um, then it also talks about building ourselves into a spiritual house. So, so as a community of living stones, what are we to build ourselves into? Well, uh, the author says to a spiritual house, uh, which a community where the spirit dwells, um, the very nature of the spirit dwells. Um, so. You know, a faith community. We build ourselves up into a faith faith community, um, and that we offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Well, what does that mean? Spiritual sacrifices. Um, well, things that are pleasing to God that we would do as a faith community that proclaim God's word um, in this in this world. And just just a couple examples that I came up with that I thought of of. Spiritual sacrifices are uh, ways that we love neighbor, um, caring for the poor, uh, our worship together. Uh, those are those I would consider all of those to be spiritual sacrifices um, that would be acceptable to God. And of course, what we the the sacrifices that we do are grounded in our our following Jesus. So, as Jesus directs us, uh, encourages us, motivates us. To act in ways of love and life, uh, those are, you know, can be the spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing to God. Uh, and of course, because the author is saying you do this as a spiritual house, uh, it's very communally focused. So we do these things as a community. Yes, we can do them as individuals, but we also do these things as a community as well. Because uh, of course, the more people involved, the more impact you can make uh, in this world uh, by doing things. So there's definitely this understanding that uh, the spiritual sacrifices are that which promote God's love and promise of life. And, um, of course, are things that we do individually, but also that we do as a community together. Um, now the, the the one part that I did struggle with on this reading, of course, is um, when the writer says they stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. So this, the reason why this is a bit of a struggle is because it brings up this question of predestination. Now predestination is a, the, is a theological understanding that God pre-chooses who will be saved and who will not be saved. So that before we're even born, God already knows whether or not we will be one of the saved, chosen, or whether we'll be one of the condemned. Um, The theologian uh, John Calvin was really big on predestination and this understanding of that certain people are chosen by God to be saved and others aren't. Um, now, if we were as we if we were to be if we as Lutherans were to believe that, which we don't, but if we were, the good news is because you are watching this video and you believe in Jesus, you are one of the chosen. <laughs> Um, 
but we, like I said, we as Lutherans do not believe in predestination. We do not believe that God pre-chooses who will be saved and who will be condemned before they're even born. There's always this understanding that the Spirit is with everyone. God has created life. God considers all life to be precious. And God has given all life the power of God's Spirit. So all life has the potential to be followers of Jesus. All life has the potential to believe in God um, and follow God's ways. So if that's the case, then there, then we, and we, if we believe that, then we can't, in good conscience, say that well, some people are saved and some people aren't. And of course, part of this is also the argument for free will, uh, and this, and the Lutheran understanding that. We have free will. Uh, God does not force us into loving God. Uh, and, and my argument with that is, of course, that um, if it's truly love, it does not force us to do anything. So, you know, because some people say, well, why doesn't God just make us all believe in, in God? Wouldn't that be easier? Well, True love does not require anything. And so if God truly loves us, which I firmly believe, then it would go against God's nature to force us to believe in God. Um, and because true love does not force its will upon the other. Uh, so, so, to believe in predestination would be to say God is forcing God's will upon us by choosing who will believe in God and who will not. Uh, so um, I disagree with the writer here when it said when he says people were destined to disobey. Uh, the only part of that that I agree with is the fact that the Lutheran understanding that we are all born in sin. Um, and that sin is the uh, sin is our preference, um, and that it is only with the Holy Spirit's power that we can then be free to believe in God. So I will I will agree with that that you know um, the son, the Lutheran understanding that. Our preference when we're born is to go against God's wishes, and only through the through the acts of the the redemption of the Holy Spirit and being given the Holy Spirit are we able to believe in God and follow and and, and have the freedom to choose to follow God's ways. Um, but this understanding of predestination, I do not affirm that uh, or agree with that, and um, but would rather. Uh, have the understanding that uh, all life is capable of believing in God and following God, and that the Spirit continually works in each of us to uh, acknowledge that we are loved by God. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't think God ever gives up on any one of us, no matter how much we may be uncertain or show unbelief or choose to follow a, a different path, um, that God is continually working on us, working in us, uh, working to uh, show, sh open our hearts to see the ways God is loving us and redeeming us and, and, and being there with us in our lives. All right, let's go ahead and uh, move on to the John 14 reading. As well, I took a little while to get there. There we go. All right. Uh, so this is John 14, verses 1 through 14. I'll go ahead and read about it, and then we'll talk about it. Jesus said to the disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. 
If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not where you know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the first seven verses here of John 14 are commonly used uh, as a funeral gospel. Um, I have preached on those first seven verses at many a funeral throughout my career as a pastor. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very, those first seven verses are very comforting to us. I mean, who doesn't love this understanding that Jesus goes and prepares a dwelling place for us in the Father's house so that we may dwell there with Jesus forever? I mean, that's just wonderful, comforting uh, imagery of, of resurrected life um, post-death for us. This understanding that Jesus will uh, create a dwelling place for us in the Father's house and we get to live there with Jesus forever. Um, so this is a, so those first seven verses are a commonly used uh, funeral text. Um, and uh, you know here we get the, this, this wonderful proclamation uh, that Jesus says, "I am the way and the truth and the life." Um, and this is, uh, you know, um, many of you may not know this, but um, back in uh, the first century of Christianity, um, actually the first few centuries of Christianity, um, Christians weren't called Christians. Um, Christianity wasn't a term that was adopted until later on. Uh, they were known as followers of the way. Um, so if you were to go back in time to uh, first century Christianity and you would say, hey, are you guys Christians? Uh, the, first of all, they probably wouldn't understand you because you're speaking English rather than Hellenistic Greek <laughs> uh, or Aramaic or Hebrew. Um, but uh, they, uh, but secondly, they would say, no, uh, we don't know what that term means, because back then they were called followers of the way. And uh, one of the reasons they called themselves followers of the way was because of this proclamation from Jesus right here in chapter 14, where Jesus says, I am the way. Uh, so, of course, they would call themselves followers of the way, with this understanding that Jesus is the way not only to God, but the way to a resurrected life. Um, so what's happening in these verses of chapter 14 is Jesus uh, is beginning his long speech discourse um, uh, before they leave to go to the garden where Jesus will be arrested and handed over uh, to the scribes and the chief priests and to Pilate and eventually crucified. Um, this uh, chapter 14, of course, follows chapter 13 where Jesus does an ultimate act of love of washing the disciples' feet. Um, there, that's the sign. And of course, then there's this long discourse, which follows 
John's writing in the gospel where there's sign then a long dialogue and discourse about about the sign and so but uh, this chapters 14 through 17 are all about Jesus's long farewell speech to his disciples and what he starts here with in chapter 14 is he starts with comforting them because um, he knows that they're going to be facing some difficult times ahead when Jesus is arrested and betrayed and murdered on the cross. So he's he starts out by comforting them, reminding them that um, no matter what happens, um, they need the, just they need to just continue to believe in him, to believe in. In, in God by believing in him because he and God are one in the same um, and that ultimately no matter what happens to him they know where he's going which is to the Father to resurrection to ascending to the Father um, which is why he says you know where I'm going uh, you know the place to where I'm going so he's saying no matter even though you're about to experience some horrible things with my arrest, uh, with me being beaten, with me being crucified on the cross, you know ultimately God's plan here, which is resurrection, me ascending to the Father, and all that jazz. Um, but of course, the disciples don't fully ever understand Jesus in this gospel until after the resurrection happens. Uh, and so Thomas says to him, uh, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Um, and what, what is kind of ironic here about this part of the text is uh, earlier in chapter 13, Jesus tells the disciples, where I'm going, you cannot come. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, Jesus means that, you know, I'm going to be ascending to the Father and you won't be able to ascend with me because you're still going to have a mission here to proclaim the good news of my death and resurrection here on earth. Um, so, uh, but <laughs> it's just a little ironic. Jesus tells them earlier on in chapter 13, uh, you can't follow me where I'm going. And now Jesus then declares here, you know the place where I'm going. And I can understand Thomas's confusion uh, where Thomas is probably like, well, wait, Jesus, you said, you said just a little while ago that we can't go where you're going. And now you tell us, you know, we know where you're going. So, but how do we know the way if we can't go where you're going? <laughs> so, um, but of course, Thomas asks this out of a place of faithfulness. It's not, it's not necessarily doubt. It's, it's this place of, uh, I think it's a place of longing. Like, we want to go where, you, where you're going, Jesus. So come on, t please tell us the way to go. You know, how can we know the way? Show us the way. And this, is, of course, Jesus' response to that is, well, I am the way, guys. Um, your way through this is to continue to believe in me. That's your way through this. The, the dark times that are coming ahead, anything that you face coming ahead, your way through it is to believe in me, to believe in me that I am, I am from the Father, that the Father is in me and I am in the Father, that we are one together to know the Father is to know me, um, and so by believing in me, you will know the way, and you will also, of course, know the truth, and of course, you will have life. Um, you know, we, we read last week in, in, in the John 10 text, the Good Shepherd Sunday text about Jesus saying, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So by believing in Jesus, you, you know the way, uh, you, you know what the truth is, and you know that you will be given life. Um, so that's Jesus' response to Thomas. And um, it's interesting because, you know, in my experience, uh, following Jesus leads to unknown places at times. Um, and when we are led to unknown places, unfamiliar places, it can be hard to find our way uh, through those places. Um, but the good news here, of course, is Jesus is always the way. So as long as we continue to follow Jesus, even if we do, even if it does take us to unfamiliar places, 
long as we continue to follow the way, Jesus will continue to lead us to that which is life-giving. Um, so then, uh, starting in verse 8, Philip asks another question to Jesus to show us the Father, still not fully understanding what Jesus is saying. And so, again, Jesus reiterates, you know, you, you see the Father by believing in me. Uh, you know, this understanding that I and, and the Father are one person. We are one together. So, by believing in me, you are believing in the Father. By watching me, you are watching God. By knowing me, you are knowing God. And, of course, he then says, and, you know, I, I've told you this many times, and we've taught you this many times, and if you're not going to at least believe in my testimony, then look at the works that I've done. I mean, come on, I, lay, I raised Lazarus from death. Could anybody but God do that? <laughs> um so that's that's kind of what he's getting at here. He's kind of he's just he's just reminding the disciples that, hey, um, you know the Father by knowing me. You you believe in the Father by believing in me, and uh, you know all my testimony has been not just from me but also from God, and the signs that I do are not just from me; they're also from God. So this understanding that by believing in me, by listening to me, by following me, you are doing you are getting to know God. Um, and then we get to this part where um, Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. So um, there's, this under, uh, there's this understanding of, well, what do we ask in Jesus' name? And... Uh, The understanding we don't want to glean from this is that Jesus is this divine wish granter. That literally anything we ask Jesus, if we ask it in his name, Jesus will give to us. That's not how this works. The understanding rather is when we ask to do things in Jesus' name that will glorify God, Jesus will do them. So for example... If we pray for a more generous heart um, so that we may care for the poor, um, and we, we do that in the name of Jesus, you know, that's, that's a prayer that Jesus will probably uh, answer and, and grant to us. Now, of course, um, there's an understanding that to become more generous, that you need to start practicing being generous. And, and that might be the answer that, to the prayer that Jesus gives us. Jesus says, well, you want, to be a, you want to have a more generous heart towards the poor? Start giving to the poor. Um, and Jesus then may present us with opportunities to do that as a way to answer that prayer. Um, so that's just one example. Um, but this, it is this with this understanding that Jesus um, will do things for us that we ask of him that glorify God and promote, again, promote life. Uh, promote God's love, uh, things of that nature. So it's not that God, that Jesus is the divine wish granter that will give us whatever we want if we ask it in, in Jesus' name. Trust me, I've tried. I've, I've, I can't remember how many times I've said, Jesus, give me a million dollars. I do this in your name. Like, do I get a million dollars? No. <laughs> it's a bad example, but, uh, but you understand. Uh, this is about... Jesus saying, do whatever in my name, or ask whatever you want, and and I will give it to you if you do it in my name, uh, that which is glorified God, that which that which proclaims the love of God and uh, in this broken world. Um, oh yeah, the last thing I wanted to talk about with this gospel was just um, Jesus talking about those doing greater works than what he's done. And and I'm, some of us are probably like, well, geez, how could we do greater works than, uh, you know, healing a blind man? How could we do greater works than raising someone from the dead? Um, but the, there are very astonishing things that happen in this world. 
Um, and we maybe have become a little desensitized to them because they're just normative for us. But when you think about it, like the development of vaccines to fight off viruses is an enormous sign uh, of life um, and God's love. Uh, that God was able to gift somebody with the, the, the knowledge um, to eventually research and study how to develop a vaccine for different viruses uh, is, is quite an amazing work when you think about it. Uh, the gift of, of songwriting, the, the hymns that give praise to God, the music that, that animates those words that we sing, uh, that is a great work in my opinion. Uh, and I know I'm a, I'm a professionally trained musician, so I might be a little bit biased, but, uh, but just the, 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 the music that gives voice to, to the words of these hymns that help us to praise God and proclaim his love are, are I think, wonderful works uh, that God has, has given us to do. Um, and of course, any time somebody volunteers for a service organization that will care for the needy, uh, the shaping and molding of that person's heart is a great work. Um, and, and the work that they do to express love to the other is a great work. Uh, so yeah, we all do wonderful, great works, greater than what Jesus did when he was walking the earth. Um, we just have to remind ourselves of that, that it doesn't necessarily look as miraculous as raising somebody from the dead, but the things that we do to love and serve neighbor are indeed great works that proclaim God's love. Um, and, and that is something that can encourage us to continue to do those things uh, in the name of Jesus, um, with the understanding that they will uh, proclaim God's love and show others the potential will open, open doors potentially for others to see the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, so I know this video is about uh, is a little bit longer uh, than the previous two. Uh, I see that my clock here is just a little over 47 minutes now. Uh, so thank you so much for hanging in there with me through these three texts. Um, there's lots of rich things to take from them, and I hope that... Uh, the Spirit has spoken to you in some ways through this video today, uh, and uh, that you'll continue to study these texts and, and listen for God speaking to you through them uh, for your lives. So let's go ahead and uh, close with a prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for giving us Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life for us. Remind us always that by following Jesus, you are leading us to that which is life-giving, that which does great works in your name. Help us in the midst of this pandemic to continue to find ways to love and serve neighbor, to continue to follow your call. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. I uh, just want to remind all of you that this Sunday, May 10th, uh, is a virtual Holy Communion Sunday for us. So I hope that you will join us for our virtual worship at 10 a.m. And of course, uh, have a bre some bread of your choice and wine or grape juice of your choice uh, uh, available for you uh, to do uh, virtual Holy Communion uh, with me uh, during our worship service. So... Uh, blessings to you. Continue to stay safe, and we'll see you again.